Hello, this is uh, Reef Wiser, Ed Wiser, uh, on the Reef to Reef Forum, and uh, today was our second episode of the Dr. Fish Call, call Show with uh, Bobby Miller. So take it away, Bobby. Hi, good to see you again, Ed. Uh, what's what? Are, what is our topic today? Are we gonna look at uh, marine velvet? I think you said you wanted to talk about that uh, to start out. Yeah, I just did a write up on uh, marine velvet disease. Um, I've been. It's one of these diseases that uh, many people know that you know you get velvet in your tank and it's kind of a, a tank killer as far as uh, fish are concerned. Um, a lot of people, you know, they think it's ick. It turns out to be velvet and it wipes out their tank 48 to 72 hours. It can. It can literally kill every single fish in your tank. Um, so I've actually been doing research. I've been purposely buying fish with velvet and experimenting on them to kind of find, I guess, what I feel is the uh, the best way to treat them, the best chance of, of saving them. Um, so I finally uh, was successful with a coal tang and a naso tang. So I sort of based the article on my experience um, with that. Um, and marine velvet disease, so marine velvet disease is actually a dinoflagellate, so it's sort of a hybrid, it's sort of a half animal, half plant, um, and when a fish has velvet, if they show visible symptoms, a lot of times it starts out looking like ick, you know, it's those classic, you know, tiny white, you know, sugar, salt, you know, um, on the fish, but the difference is velvet is actually a little bit smaller than ick, and whereas ick is more sort of here and there on the fish, when a fish has velvet, if they show visible symptoms, um, it typically starts on the fins, but then what will happen, usually sometimes within a matter of like 12 to 24 hours, the fish is just completely covered in, you know, these tiny white dots. And, and that's one way to tell the difference between velvet and ick, because typically ick, you know, typically ick does not completely cover the fish like this. Um, it, some people have described velvet as a good way as like it's more like a dust. It's almost like the 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 fish has been dusted like a fine sugar or powdered sugar. Um, so so that's kind of the difference. And the 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 life cycle is similar. Uh, the treatment is somewhat similar, but there are some differences uh, between you know how to treat velvet and how to treat ick. And that's what I base the article on. Is like this is my my experience treating velvet and how it was successful. You know. To save these two fish, is there uh, any particular uh, medication you recommend to uh, to uh, treat velvet? Well, so you, you would treat in a sense like the primary way of treating velvet is the same as ick. You can use copper, or you can use uh, chloroquine phosphate CP, which some people are using. Uh, that's the primary treatment. But because velvet, the fish is so inundated. Um, with the parasites, you actually have to do some other extra steps with velvet that you would not do with ick. Um, typically, if a fish has ick, you know, you drop them in copper. 30 days later, you have an ick-free fish. Uh, with velvet, you actually have to do first a freshwater dip, um, five minutes. I learned off of a, a British website, actually, that uh, they've done research that a five-minute freshwater dip, I think it's like eradicates between 80 to 90% of velvet on the fish. And the most important thing is it, it, it clears the gills. Um, and in my early experiments, I, I just thought that would be enough. I thought I could do the freshwater dip, put the fish in copper, but every time I would do that, I would still lose the fish. So then I discovered that you have to follow up the freshwater dip with a chemical bath. Um, you can use Aquavin or you can use formalin. Um, I personally prefer Aquavin because it's not a carcinogen. So I don't really like using formalin unless I have to because, you know, you yourself have to be very careful with formalin, handling it, you know, your hands and everything. Um, but I did a, um, a one hour and 15 minute bath with Aquavin and then I transferred the fish into a quarantine tank that was pre-dosed with chloroquine phosphate, but you could use copper in, in lieu of CP. And the other thing that I missed in early experimentation uh, was because velvet is such an aggressive pathogen, you're almost likely, you're gonna have a, a secondary bacterial infection. So then I discovered that you need for at least that first week, you have to treat with a, like a broad spectrum, broad spectrum antibiotic, such as uh, canamycin, canaplex, or uh, furin-2. You have to treat that in conjunction with either copper or CP. So it's actually, a, 
you know, it's well actually a difference of uh, three different medications plus the freshwater dip that you have to use to actually completely clear the fish's velvet. Do you uh, have you ever tried like a one hundred percent water change every three days? And would that do any good? Or, uh, um, I've never tried that. I, I've tried so that that would be there's something similar a tank transfer method where um, every three days you move the fish into a whole new tank, new tank, new water. Um, I've done that to treat ick. Um, I'm not sure whether that would work on velvet because the life cycle of velvet is accelerated. So whereas, um, if I remember, I'm trying to remember this from memory, I think the shortest time that velvet can stay on a fish is 12 hours, but the longest time is actually four days. So there, there's, a, there's a big difference in the life cycle based on the strain that you're dealing with. Um, but I mean, maybe that could work, maybe, or even like a daily um, moving the fish into a different tank could possibly work for velvet. I think it would, it would also depend on uh, people's resources to do that. You know, some people might not have the, the, the tanks or the, uh, the uh, area to do, have a lot of room to right. fish around kind of thing. It was for, I would see the biggest issue with that where they're over say just toasting uh, a chemical to the fish in that situation. Um, is there any other, uh, on the, on the, how would you get a hold of uh, some of the chemicals? Like the, Acla, Acla, what's the first one? Acla white. <laughs> I'm not good spot. Um, Aclavin. Um, so there's, you can order that online. There's a, um, and maybe some, some local fish shops sell it as well, but you can actually, I think, go right on Amazon or, some of the other online retailers, and it's called Aquavin MS. Um, the only company I know that makes Aquavin that puts it actually in their product is Ruby Reef Rally, actually contains Aquavin. And it's actually the product that I did use. I used Ruby Reef Rally because that contains Aquavin in it. And that's what I, when I did the experimentation with the two tanks, it's actually the product I use. Um, but you can just buy straight Aquavin um, either from a, um, uh, maybe a local fish shop or online. Um, the CP that, that, that's hard to get because that is actually an FDA controlled substance because, so you have to have, you literally have to go to a vet who writes you a prescription, you take it to a pharmacy to be filled. And a lot of times a vet, you know, unless it's a, a vet that deals in exotic animals, they don't want to do that. Um, so that's why I think practically speaking, most people would need to use, I guess, copper, uh, which works on velvet as well instead of CP. Um, and the antibiotics you can buy at most local fish shops, um, Canaplex or Furin2 are both broad spectrum antibiotics. You could get those online or, or at, I'd say most local fish shops. One thing, one thing I did was, uh, I, I'm real good friends with my, my dog's vet, so I'm helping her set up a, a marine aquarium so now I can get any kind of drugs I want now. That's the best oh. way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Always be if you have if you have dogs, always get be real friendly with your with your dog's vet, and she can get you anything you want. <laughs> yeah, all you got to do is uh, you can get a prescription for CP and uh, uh, take it to your local pharmacy. You're set because uh, um, the dosage is typically anywhere from forty to eighty milligrams per gallon. So if you can get your hands on twenty or thirty grams of CP, you're you're good for years as far as quarantine is concerned. And Right, and that is a, a better, better medication for more broader water uh, disease uses too, isn't it? Uh, yeah, C CP is is nice because so CP treats the four big external parasites. CP treats ick, velvet, brook, and uranema. So um, where copper copper does treat ick and velvet, copper does not treat uranema or or brook that you know clownfish get. Um, the other thing about CP is it's not as harsh. On the fish, you typically will not see, um, you won't see the side effects that you see sometimes with copper, the appetite suppression. Uh, you know, sometimes sometimes fish with copper, just depending on the species. I mean, there's certain fish you can't even use copper on, like mandarins, puffers, lions, things like that. So the only fish I have found that you can't use CP on is a six-line wrasse. And I don't understand that because I've quarantined fairy and flasher wrasses with it, no problem. But every six line wrasse I've used with CP, I've lost. <laughs> so that's, I wonder why that is. That's a, that's a strange one there. It is strange. It is very strange. So, 
I, I know you said you, you need to move fast when you find this out on your uh, – you see this on your fish because it, it's a fast killer, right? Yes. And uh, so so you got just a few hours to get going on, on if you have a problem with – with the marine velvet, that's the problem because it'll basically smother the fish in uh, in uh, over time, short period of time. Well, and that's one of the problems with velvet is is sometimes, um, and there's been users on reef to reef that have experienced this. Um, so typically, what happens the first the velvet invades the gills first, which will most external parasites will do. They seem for whatever reason they invade the gills. So they get into the gills, and if there are enough of them get into the gills, the fish can suffocate and die right there. So you may, you, you may lose a fish to velvet, and you may actually never see external visible symptoms because if enough of them get into the gills and literally uh, suffocate the fish to death, the fish can die right there. Um, and there are some other symptoms that are more behavioral symptoms you'll see. Um, there's, there's that. Of course, you'll see the, the typical rubbing, the flashing, um, the head twitching, like, but you see those with, with gill flukes and ick. Um, but two symptoms, behavioral symptoms that I can think of that are pretty exclusive to velvet. Fish with velvet will swim into the flow of a power head because they're trying to relieve the symptoms um, from their gills. And for some, other, some reason, velvet makes fish sensitive to light. So if you have a fish that's kind of hiding and purposely staying like out of the light, that's another possibility that the fish could have velvet. Do you find it more common to uh, have this problem uh, on uh, newer, newer fish maybe that, or is it, does it come into the, the different times of the year in the uh, fish shops or do you see anything like, like that go on? I mean, as far as getting the whole shipment of, fish with uh, velvet or just sometimes you get a shipment with, with ick, I know that. You know. Right. Uh, it's, it's the same way with velvet. Um, typically, it, it comes in new fish that are there, that are coming from the wholesaler. I mean, there's a local fish shop I advise. He has lost entire shipments almost to velvet. Um, and he actually was at MACNA, and he was talking just to some of the other local fish shop owners and actually to some of the wholesalers that were there, and they were telling him that I guess over the past – 12 to 18 months, velvet has been running rampant um, through a lot of wholesalers. Um, so it's, and then, you know, so it's, it's, it's the wholesalers are getting it, but you know, the way the industry works, you know, fish are moved so quickly from the, you know, the collector to the wholesaler to the local fish shop that a lot of times the problem just gets passed on to the local fish shop. The end user buys the fish. Next thing you know, you got velvet in your tank. Right. And a lot of, uh, Distributors buy their fish from major collectors overseas. Right. Going to all the different distributors, and so you can get a whole big batch of this stuff come in and go all the way across the whole country at one time. And that's that's what we're seeing a lot of times with with fish diseases. Right. And and it, El velvet like it has a tomount stage. So when it does drop off the fish, it insists and in like you know would insist upon rock, substrate, glass any hard surface so you could have a fish a shipment with velvet they could have left your facility but they could have left the tomonks behind which are then rupturing releasing the dino spores into the water and infecting the next batch of fish and another little kicker about velvet because it is a dinoflagellate um, it's able to use light um, as a means of, of, uh, of obtaining energy so velvet dino spores are actually capable of the free swimmers um, they can actually be infected for up to 15 days because they're using light as energy in lieu of a, a fish host to feed upon. And you also mentioned also you got to watch about uh, aerosol transmission of velvet in the uh, aquariums. Yeah, I don't, I don't by memory, I don't remember the exact study, but it's in um, it's in the sticky on reef to reef. Um, the ten, no, foot, ten foot. You said ten foot. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It, it was like actually 9.84 feet or something, but actually the study that, that they did that proved aerosol transmission, they actually used velvet um, is, is the subject matter of the, of the, um, the subject matter of the experiment that they did. What's that, uh, what's that tank you got behind you today? What tank are you using? Yeah, this is, let me turn it for a second. 
that kind of get it. So, yeah. so this is my my 29 gallon frag tank, and I know a lot of people on um, on Reef to Reef have been asking me lately about quarantining corals and inverts. Um, so this is just what I use, and it, it's it's a, a 29 gallon uh, tank, and it has minimal rock in it. Um, and it's really simple. There's no sump or anything hooked up to it. Um, I just have a, if you can see it, a hang on the back um, power filter that I use for filtration. I do have an MP10 on it, but you, you could get by with like a Corellia, like, like a cheaper power head. Uh, heater, uh, some sand, rock. I do have a frag rack. Um, and I typically, sometimes I don't have it hooked up right now. I'll hook up like a little hang on the back protein skimmer to it. But I mean, you literally can can quarantine um, your corals and inverts in, in an environment like this. The, the lighting is a cheap four bulb T5. I think I paid like hundred dollars for it used uh, light fixture. And um, because the problem is, um, especially with with corals, is you can get tomones, ictomones, velvet tomones can come in on the corals and can actually stay insisted to the corals for actually up to seventy two days if you get like the worst strain of it there is and then those can actually then rupture release therons into the water and infect your fish so and unfortunately it's not just enough to quarantine your fish you also have to quarantine all of your corals in your inverts and that's what i do with with this setup all right that's a nice little setup to uh to quarantine your your corals if you have the space to do it. Even a smaller tank would work fine like that. You know? Oh yeah, you, you could do. I mean, this this is a um, a twenty nine gallon, but you could do even just a ten gallon or something, or even a five gallon, depending on how many corals or inverts um, you're going to quarantine at one time. And it really it, it's so it's like what what inverts can or can't um, you know carry tomos. And there actually was a study done on done on it. Um, and so obviously corals are most at risk because they're they're just you know they're immobile they're just there stationary um, and especially if you get a coral with a plug because you know especially with like a ceramic plug or something well that's something that a parasite can easily um, insist upon um, then shrimp can even though they're they're mobile you know they have a hard exoskeleton so a tomo could insist upon that so. Shells are another big one. Snail shells, that's a really, you know, hard surface for a parasite tomon to insist upon. Um, now, I, I think the odds of actually getting a, a parasite diseasing your tank by inverts is, is highly un unlikely. But if, if you're one of these people, you want to be close to 100% sure, then this is like the second quarantine you have to do as well as fish. Well, one, you know, for me, uh, invert quarantining or cor corals would be best just from the hitchhikers that come in that are parasitic to to the corals themselves like you know zoa nudibranx or yep red bugs <laughs> or, you know we have so many different types of coral parasites that can come on that uh, we also need to think about that for future when we're, when we're bringing corals into a system is that you also might need to do a, a control on those because you're bringing all kinds of things. There was like an SBS coral spider that is half in the market and it's causing a lot of problems on distributors. So you always need to keep that in mind when you're uh, bringing new, system, new corals into your system. And, and what a lot of people don't realize, you know, a lot of people use coral dips and that that's great, but the problem is coral dips they will eradicate the coral pest. They don't eradicate the eggs. So a lot of times, you know, you, you can you can get rid of the coral pests by using a coral dip, but then if they have left any eggs behind and those eggs hatch and the coral is now in your tank, then it's going to release like that next generation of, um, of pest into your DT. And the way I look at it, you know what, I'd much rather have like an outbreak of a nasty and something like this. That, I mean, I could break that down within a few hours if I had to than in my 150 gallon, you know, display tank. Right. We don't want to, we don't want to get a mess going on, uh, on, uh, on in your big tank. That's for sure. Exactly. Well, uh, how do you clean the How do you clean the QT tank after you're finished with it? Do you ever break it down and just clean it, uh, in that way of uh, using any kind of chemicals on it to, uh, to sterilize it in any way? 
You're talking about a, like a fish quarantine tank? Yeah, like a fish quarantine tank. Or what would you do to sterilize the tank? Say after you take it down, if you don't have another fish coming in, you want to sterilize that tank after you're finished with it? If, if in a case of velvet, I think it would be something probably yeah. uh, good to do. Um, what I like to do is I just drain all the water. I take the tank and all the equipment outside, and I will soak it like in a water vinegar solution, uh, one part vinegar, ten parts water, let it soak for a few hours, and then I'll just sort of like wipe all the equipment and the inside of the tank down really good, again, using vinegar. Um, take everything, let it air dry for two or three days. That's actually going to be the sterilization process. Uh, just let it air dry for two or three days, and then that will kill any – leftover diseases, you know, ick, velvet, anything that was on it. Um, that's what I personally do. There are some people that use bleach. So they will, it's the same method as the vinegar, but instead of using vinegar, they'll use a 10 to 1 bleach solution. Um, and you can do that, and that's perfectly fine. And bleach will kill on contact. But the only thing is you have to be really, really sure that you've rinsed the tank out really well and all the equipment before reusing it if you're going to use bleach. Well, uh, you know, you want to make sure just sunlight itself a lot of times is a good uh, disinfectant on, uh, on this kind of a system, a QT system. Just have it be out in the bright sun for uh, right. a couple days. It helps out a lot. I right. also wanted to bring up uh, your club is having a, uh, a, a choral show coming up soon. And now we want to, and you're going to be speaking and want to say something about that. Uh, yes, we're having a, uh, my club that I'm, I'm one of the moderators is Louisiana Reef Club, and it's our 10-year anniversary, and we're having a 10-year anniversary party um, and fundraiser um, at Coral Fever in Raceland, Louisiana. It's actually October 24th, so a week from this upcoming Saturday, and it's just an opportunity for, because, you know, our we're so spread out all over the state. Everybody can come from all different parts of Louisiana, and we can get together and have some good food. Um, I'm one of the guest speakers. Um, it's also, I got to remember, there, there's another guest speaker that's a lot more famous than I am. Uh, Tony Vargas. Tony Vargas. <laughs> yeah, Tony Vargas is, is our is our featured uh, guest speaker. He's going to be there, and we're going to have vendors um, from all the shops from all over the state come. And we're even doing a, um, um, it's you know Halloween time, so we're doing a costume contest for the kids, and uh, the winner gets a. a Toys R Us gift card, and we've got tons of uh, a lot of vendors that have really been good to us, and they've donated a lot of prizes. And we're going to be um, doing like um, prizes, and then we're going to like donations, and you get tickets, and uh, then you win prizes from that. So we've got everything from a like a three thousand dollar aquarium full setup down to LED lights and pumps and everything that we're going to be giving away. So it's going to be a good time. That sounds like a great time. Uh I know uh, everybody should go with her in the area to go to go to your all's event, and uh, I'll put a big uh, posting right here on the screen for everybody so they can see where it's at, and and I'll link uh, in the in the notes on our posting when we post this to the forum about how to get to it. And it'll be out this next week, so okay. I'll make sure to get you all a lot of people down there to see you all and uh, see you talk in person. So well, thank you, uh, Bobby, for this week's show, and we'll see you soon. Um, talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ed.